All right, let's, let's just pray real quick. Uh, Lord, may the uh, words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm preaching on Romans 13, 8 to 14 this morning. You probably read the H.G. Wells classic, The Invisible Man, in high school. It's about Griffin, a scientist specializing in optics, uh, who invents a potion that makes him invisible. Now, that would be pretty cool, I think we all think, but it, one thing, uh, Griffin cannot become uninvisible. He doesn't have an invisibility switch to turn on and off. So rather than an amazing scientific discovery, his invisibility becomes a curse, leading Griffin down a dark, lonely, and eventually fatal path. You see, it is only when he is wearing clothing a coat, a hat, a scarf, that he can be seen and known by others. And without clothing of some kind, uh, it's as though he doesn't really exist. He loses touch with his own humanity and, and as an embodied soul. And in the final irony of Griffin's uh, tortured, invisible life, he becomes visible again only in death. This morning, I want to suggest that as believers in Jesus Christ, we can become like the invisible man. And this is what I mean. As Christians, many of us, myself included, can live relatively invisible lives. People around us don't really see us. They don't really see the real part of us, the reality uh, that we are followers of Jesus. And just like Griffin, I think, you know, we've probably found potions that can make our true nature in Christ invisible to others. Fear of rejection or persecution is a potion that keeps us from testifying to our faith. Or cloaking our Christianity with passivity is a potion we use to let others know that our faith is a private matter. Or protecting a private area of sin can become a potion of hypocrisy to cover up who we really are. These potions may be used intentionally or just out of habit or unintentionally, but the underlying motivation is always the same. We know that once we become visible, once our Christianity becomes real to others around us, that's when we become vulnerable, open to possible ridicule, rejection, persecution, maybe even martyrdom. And that is, in fact, exactly what the Apostle Paul believed and taught. Just before he was martyred, Paul told his protege, Timothy, quote, Indeed, all who desire to live in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In other words, those who live in a way that makes Jesus in them visible will be, not might be, will be persecuted. And yet Paul, the greatest apostle, always exhorts us to be visible Christians. Now, before we talk about today's passage, it helps to understand that Paul's letter to the Romans is like two beats of a heart. Chapters 1 through 11 is the inflow of all that God has done for us and for Israel. Chapters 12 to 16 is the outflow of how we should then live as Christians. And tucked between the theology of how we, sh of practical, uh, the theology and the practical wisdom, Two verses function as what we'll call a critical hinge. You probably know Romans 12, 1 and 2 by heart, but let me offer my own personal and slightly amplified uh, version uh, this morning, paraphrase. Verse 1, Therefore, I urge you all, because God has shown you mercy in Christ, 1 through 11, stand with him, yielding your body to serve God as a living and holy sacrifice, which is how you worship him. Verse 2, and stop letting the world tell you how to think, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind with God's truth. When you do that, you will, by doing God's will, show what real Christianity looks like, that it is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now listen to his words again. You will, by doing God's will, show what real Christianity looks like. 
In other words, your orthodoxy, or what you believe, 1 to 11, will determine your orthopraxy, or how you believe, 12 through 16. Verse 1 looks back at the, at the orthodoxy of 1 to 11 and 2 to the orthopraxy in the uh, closing uh, chapters. And what follows from verse 2 is Paul's explanation of what he means by doing God's will to, quote, show what real Christianity looks like. He says it's about being the gifted body of Christ, being devoted to one another in love, blessing others, overcoming evil with good, being subject to government, not judging others, helping the weak in faith, denying ourselves, and living faithfully. But tucked into all that practical admonishment is our passage for today, Romans 8, uh, 13, uh, verses 8 to 14. But these seven verses stand out because they are very different from all the practical and pragmatic passages before them and after them. Yes, they're about what it means to be visible to others as a Christian, but more than just how that should happen, Paul wants his readers to understand why we should be visible and why being invisible is not an option. To hear the point the Apostle Paul is making, we'll need to take his words one section at a time, uh, one section of the passage. So let's start with verses 8 to 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, in these opening words, Paul goes to the very heart of the teaching of Jesus and of Paul's own theology, that we are no longer judged by the law, but that we are under grace and that we should unconditionally love others because that's how God loves us. For the Christian, then, love is a debt that we owe to all persons, not just to believers, but to everyone. But more than that, it is what Paul calls a continuing debt, an indebtedness that, what, can never be paid. In other words, you can never tell the man who harms you in any way, I've forgiven you, so I don't have to love you anymore. And you cannot say about the person who spreads false gossip about you, oh, if she's going to do that, then I don't have to love her anymore. And you cannot harbor in your heart a bitterness about your spouse. That was so hurtful and unloving, but I can give as good as I can get, and I sure will. There is no time that you or I can take a pass on loving others. No matter how bad the other person may seem, how evil, how disagreeable, how unlovable, nothing can satisfy or cancel my continuing debt to love that person as God loves him. In fact, Paul says that, quote, love fulfills the law. And by law here, he means the Ten Commandments, the core commands of the Jewish law. But how exactly does love do that? Paul explains that it is because, quote, love does no harm to a neighbor. That kind of harm-free neighbor love, he explains, is reflected in the last five of the Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and don't covet. Paul simply ratifies what Jesus had previously taught as a cornerstone of his gospel. But we need to put that teaching of Jesus in a bit more perspective to better understand just how it is that love fulfills the law. If you will recall, a scribe <coughs> had asked Jesus, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? This scribe, an expert in the law, was not referring to the Ten Commandments, but was actually asking Jesus a technical rabbinical question that scribes enjoyed endlessly debating, which is, of the 613 commands that the Jewish rabbis had defined as either greater or lesser commands, what is the greatest command? 
And Jesus, who was a rabbi himself, answers the scribe's question by quoting from the ultimate expression of Jewish identity, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6. He says there, or he's, he, in Matthew, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And immediately after that, quoting from Leviticus 19.18, he adds that the second greatest command is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This too was rabbinical teaching. But that prompts another scribe to ask another question of great rabbinical debate, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers that question with a story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is anyone near to you to whom you can show mercy and love. So Jesus' answer to the scribe is that the greatest commandments in simple words are to love God and to love people. And Jesus clarifies his answer for, for the scribe by declaring, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. But don't, make, don't miss why these two make so much sense. When I love God, I'm fulfilling the first five of the Ten Commandments. When I love my neighbor, I'm fulfilling the last five. So love God, love your neighbor. That's the echo of Jesus you should hear in Paul's words in his letter to the Romans. It's how, in Paul's conclusion, quote, love fulfills the law. And it is the foundation for what I believe Paul is saying in our patches today about becoming a visible Christian. Now this sermon is titled, Putting on Jesus. Because, as you will hear, Paul says that is what we need to be doing. We may prefer to be invisible or just default to invisibility out of habit, but Paul says it's not an option. We need to put on Jesus so we become visible as followers of Christ. And I want to suggest three ways from this passage that Paul says we are to do that. How we are to put on Jesus so others see the real us, the Jesus in us, who has saved and redeemed us and made us new creations. The first way we put on Jesus is what we've just read, is to put on love. Now, Paul doesn't use that actual phrase here, but that is what he is saying. He gives a fuller explanation of putting on love when he writes about two years later to the Colossian church in 3, 12 to 14. This is what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, literally in the Greek, put on, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together. In perfect unity. So the first way we put on Jesus for others to see is when we put on love. And according to Paul, love is above any other virtue we can put on, like a piece of clothing, and it binds them all together. Love is the full and perfect expression of the nature of Jesus. So Paul says, don't be invisible, put on love. Now let's move on to the second way we can put on Jesus in the next two verses, 11 and 12. He says, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now I'm going to jump ahead here and talk about only the last line of verse 12. And we'll come back to the skipped over part in a moment. The second way Paul says we can put on Jesus is to put on the armor of light. And I'm sure you hear in those words echoes of Paul's command in Ephesians 6.11 to, quote, put on the full armor of God. But the word for armor in, in both verses actually means more. The word literally means weapon. And our, in our Romans passage, the word is plural. So Paul literally admonishes his readers to put on the weapons of light he doesn't say specifically what those are, but the spiritual weaponry he describes in detail in the Ephesians certainly gives us some clues. The girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace, 
the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the word sword of the word of God. And interestingly, Ephesians isn't the only place Paul uses this idea of spiritual weaponry. Earlier in Romans 6.13, he says that we should present our bodies to God as instruments, literally as weapons, of righteousness. And in 2 Corinthians 10.4, he says that the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful for the destruction of speculations raised up against the knowledge of God. <clears throat> When Paul admonishes his readers in our passage today to, quote, put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor or weapons of light, he is telling us as Christians to arm ourselves with everything that is true about God and his word. We are to put on every weapon of truth that God has given us to fight against, as he says in Ephesians, quote, the schemes of the devil, against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And when we put on light, others can see the real us, that we are faithful and visible Christians who are, like the Philippians, quote, holding fast the word of life, and who will, like Timothy, quote, fight the good fight of faith. We need to put on all the armor of light that we can. So in order not to be invisible, first, we are to put on love. Second, we are to put on light. Now let's look at the third way that we put on Jesus in verses 13 and 14. Let us, and he says there, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather Clothe yourselves, literally, put on, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. When Sally and I were raising young teens, someone gave us a good maxim to remember for setting curfews. Nothing good ever happens after midnight. In other words, there was no good reason our teens needed to be out past midnight. Why? The masthead slogan for the Washington Post says it more succinctly, democracy dies in darkness. And I think Paul would have agreed with a paraphrased slogan for the church, decency dies in darkness. The light of daytime is when we are clearly seen for who we are. The dark of night is when we can't be seen. And that's when the indecent things happen that Paul enumerates. Behavioral sin of carousing and drunkenness. Sexual sin of immorality and debauchery. And relational sin of dissension and jealousy. But as believers, Paul says that we are to, quote, behave decently as in the daytime. We are to live well in the light of day. But how do we do that? Is Paul saying we just need to learn how to be behave as a decent person to act acceptably and not do uh, bad things? It's, is it all up to us to be good? I don't think so. The rather that he inserts in the verse is meant to contrast a law-bound way of thinking with a new way of thinking. And Paul provides a two-step prescription for how to live decently as a Christian. First, he says positively, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very simple. If you're choosing to live in the light of Jesus, you'll always be living in the daytime. If you want to live decently, stay in the light of Jesus. Secondly, Paul says negatively, don't gratify the desires of your sin nature. And it's also very simple. If you're choosing to avoid things that feed your fleshly desires in the darkness, then you will be living uh, in the daytime. If you want to live decently, avoid the darkness of ungodly media, books, people, and activities. Train your mind to say no to ungodliness and to think on things that are good and godly. Paul says, do those two simple things, live in Christ's life, avoid light, and avoid the darkness, and you'll be living decently as in the daytime. But in order to live, quote, as in the daytime, what exactly does Paul mean by clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ? Or, in a title of our sermon, put on Christ, put on Jesus. How do you do that? I believe it means simply to choosing to let him live within you. 
And that happens how? By the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Galatians 5.16, quote, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. To walk simply means to live by the Spirit. And it's not about living by rules or by law, since he also says a verse later, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And if you're not under the law, then when you put on the life of Christ, you are also putting on love. How do I know that? Because that's what Paul says a verse earlier in Galatians, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Sound familiar? That takes us back to where we started our passage today. So then let's review. Remember Griffin, the invisible man. If we're not going to be invisible as Christians, we need to put on Jesus so others can see the real us, the Jesus us. And I've suggested that Paul says in this passage today that there are three ways to put on Jesus. When we put on his love, when we put on his light, and when we put on his life. If you can remember those three simple words, love, light, life, you'll have a memorable model for putting on Jesus every day. Just ask yourself as you go through, through your day, have I put on the love, light, and life of Jesus today? Can others see the real me, which is Jesus in me? We all, as believers, have to choose to be seen, and we do that by putting on Jesus. We're almost done, but now we need to go back to the verses I passed over earlier. I'll try to be brief, but they are important because they'll answer a final question. Why is all this stuff about putting on Jesus important anyway? Can't I just try to stay faithful, be a good Christian, and live a decent life? And sure, you can. But the question is, is that enough? Will that make you truly visible or just a little less invisible? To answer that question, let's go back and look at the verses we skipped over earlier. So after making his case that love fulfills the law in verses 8 to 10, Paul gets very metaphorical and eschatological in verses 11 and 12. He does this because he wants his readers to understand and, and put their salvation into proper perspective. He starts by saying, and do this. By this, he means putting on the love of Jesus. Verse 11, he says, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. When Paul says to understand the present time, he uses the Greek term kairos, he wanted his readers to understand that he meant the present season in which he and they were all living. The particular time appointed by God that was uniquely theirs and could be no one else's. He meant that they were to understand their historical moment in the long and unfolding story of redemption. Jews had been waiting for salvation for their entire history, waiting for their delivery, their savior, their Messiah and coming king. Those promises were fulfilled in Jesus. But there was a greater eschatological salvation that was still yet to come, the restoration of God's kingdom and the redemption of all creation. They have the promise of salvation in Christ, but the greater fulfillment of all the promises of salvation, Paul says, is nearer than it's ever been. It's the, quote, thy kingdom come part of the prayer that Jesus had taught them to pray. So Paul admonishes, admonishes them, it's time to stop sleeping like it's night and wake up because that day is coming. Verse 12, quote, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. In other words, the night that has been their earthly travail and time of troubles is about to pass and the day is coming. What day? The day of the Lord. The day when Jesus will return and all salvation history will come to a close and suffering will end and eternal joy with God will begin. That's what Paul wants them to understand. The day of the Lord is almost here. And let's be clear, Paul's words are not just for that first generation of believers. They are for every generation since the cross that waits for the day of the Lord to 
that waits for his return, when the kingdom comes, when our night becomes his day, we have exactly the same hope as the Christians of Paul's time. We are also in a kairos season of waiting for that day of the Lord, just as future generations will be waiting for that day until Christ returns. But as we wait, we don't put on the love and light and light of Jesus just to show the world that we're good Christians. We put on Jesus, why? Because the time is short and the day of the Lord is always near. Do you remember earlier when I quoted Paul from his letter to the Philippians about us, quote, holding fast the word of life? I didn't read the rest of that verse then, but I will now because there is a specific reason Paul says we are to do that. Quote, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Paul was looking ahead to the day of Christ. And that's why we put on love, the light, and the life of Jesus. We put them on to have reason to glory when Jesus returns that we are not living our lives invisibly and without purpose. No, we are living our lives visibly and with purposeful expectation that the return of our Savior is not some far-off distant event but it is near, close at hand, because, in Paul's words, quote, the day is almost here. We put on Jesus to show others that he is real, that he has made us real, and that we want them to know him because they can see him alive in us. Because that is how Jesus becomes visible to the world, through us as Christians, which literally means we are little Christs. We put on Christ because we know the night is passing and the day is near. We know he could come at any time, and that should create an urgency in our spirits. So we put on Christ, his love, his light, his life, for one powerful reason, to make him visible. Paul told the Colossian church that was the very purpose of his apostleship and teaching that the truth entrusted to him would be manifested to and through believers so all the world would know God's hidden mystery, which he said is, quote, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So in our Kairos, our unique season of God's history, in this time of viral and economic distress, when fear and anxiety inhabit the hearts of our neighbors, we put on love to show them the love and grace and mercy of Jesus for them. And then this kairos of competing narratives that create confusion and uncertainty in all of our minds, we put on light to arm ourselves with the weapons of God's truth to thwart, thwart the devil's attempts to distort and defeat the gospel of the kingdom. And finally, in our kairos of death and despair, when we have a message of life and hope for the world, we put on life to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord, and to be his life for the dying world to see. And in all these ways, love, light, life, we put on Jesus. So let us awaken from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Let us live in the light of day and let Christ in us no longer be invisible but visible. Let us put on Jesus. Amen.